Make your own choices. Uh, that's what I think. Trust your own wisdom. Trust yourself to do what you need to do so you stay connected to your wisdom. One of the real benefits of kind of working to be making friends with your enemies is that it helps to depolarize your mind because some of your thoughts are en you experience as enemies. Any thought that is an obstruction to what your, current, your mind is currently trying to experience. Say you're trying to experience some love, but it keeps getting obstructed by some sort of thought that is the opposite of love. So even by, saying, by, arousing, by working with those four measurables, by spending a little moment each time you practice to think about not only think about how the love within yourself, the, the love for family, friends, and the love for adversaries. Because without adversaries, you couldn't really walk the path. That's just how it works here. That's kind of part of the engine that helps us keep going. And you see what I mean? So then as soon as you experience a negative thought, or negative in, in this case, the context is negative means it, uh, something that, a thought that is, helps cause suffering. I don't mean negative as in the negative mind, like we sometimes talk about it in Kundalini Yoga. But in this context, a negative thought, a thought, negative emotion, negative thought is a thought that perpetuates my suffering. So when a negative thought comes, that's an enemy, so to speak. It's just language. It's not, it's an adversary. It's adversarial. True? And so if I am living with the awareness of the value of adversarial energy in life, then it's not just a negative. It's also, there's a positive to it because it helps me practice the Dharma. Helps me practice the Dharma. That's a pretty good thing because that's like the main thing I'm trying to do here in planet Earth. So what's so bad about that? Well, it feels bad. <laughs> this is a bit of the twelfth house. <clears throat> the twelfth house is though the house of the final house of moksha, the final house of liberation. Everybody here is at a yoga event. You're supposed to be totally interested in moksha. <laughs> the people tend to not like the twelfth house, but in a certain way, it's the most positive house. The twelfth house is the house of moksha, liberation from karmic bondage. It's here that the true spiritual goal of life is achieved. But most commonly, this is the house that signifies all types of loss. So what's that all about? It's the house, it's, it's the house of the most significant spiritual goal of life, liberation, moksha, nirvana. And nobody likes it when their Jupiter goes into their 12th house. Or generally speaking, people aren't looking forward to that. Why? Because it tends to cause expenses in your bank account. Because it works on all the facets of life. But in order to have real moksha, m m real liberation, loss needs to occur. Loss of attachment is what has to happen. And there's healthy types of attachment in an integrated human life, I think. You should be somewhat attached to having some level of financial responsibility, say if you have children. You know, or if, or if you know, we all have debts in this world. And the first debt that we have is that we are, have the debt to our parents. Because at, at the most basic level, we don't exist in this form without them. And, or we at least owe debt to whoever kept us alive before we were able to keep ourselves alive. There's a basic debt there. So no matter how much we may not like those people that kept us alive when we couldn't keep ourselves alive, there is still something there. These are deep karmas, aren't they? So anyways, there's some healthy attachment. Healthy attachments to family give us a good sense of responsibility. 
But real attachment is when we are going through suffering when transformation takes place. So when we're, when we're attached with a high level of, intensi- of emotional intensity to things, then of course, when those, if we're attached with a high level of emotional intensity to things that are changing in nature, are transient in nature, well, as soon as that thing that we're emotionally attached to disappears, we will experience an equal and opposite pain and suffering. That's just physics. Make sense? Say we are intensely and emotionally attached to a lover. Who has ever done that one before? <laughs> and then one day that lover stopped being your lover. <laughs> and so and and so that transformation of that relationship's identity takes place, that's absolutely natural for life. This is how life works. Things come together, things fall apart. So we get attached where we have strong narratives. And that's what our mind does. It creates narratives. It always is creating a narrative. That's its job. So when a yogi realizes that, you realize there's going to be a narrative no matter what. You're either going to have suffering or you're going to have happy. Part of what yoga practice is all about is, constant, is, ga- is gathering the, the, the power to actually n- know that you have a choice and have the vitality to actually make a choice in daily living. So I might want to might really love the idea of practicing and experiencing compassion, but will I have the inner vitality to continue that process along the way? That's what that's what sadhana and dharma practices are all about. It's keeping the vitality to to be able to make real choices as opposed to be making choices within the momentum of just karmic habits. You understand what I mean? To keep choose the same thing over and over again, but it always looks a little different because it's a, the whole thing's a mirage anyways. <laughs> it was a good sounds. <laughs> um, so if you do have the choice of whether be happy or suffer both are two sides of the same coin which do you prefer <laughs> so this is the wisdom of the positive mind but Part of being able to stay in the positive mind has to do with recognizing that the positive mind is ultimately an illusion. It's ult- or in other words, it ultimately la- lacks permanent reality. It lacks permanent substance. Because positive has an equal and opposite polarity called negative. You can't have one without the other. But how do we want to live? And to know that, to keep the mind in a place where we can recognize, you know, relatively speaking for us, what is real and what is not real. And, and then it's much easier to notice where we're attaching to things that are not real. We still might do it anyways, but then to be aware that we're doing it is actually... Uh, a lot more pleasant experience because it gives us some wisdom. Do you know what I mean? We might know, yeah, I'm way attached to this. You know, that's okay. Why? Because the whole thing is beautiful. The whole thing is uh, is wisdom in motion. So in in, if taking out the duality of it where, where 
painful things are negative is a hard way to live. That's what the 12th house teaches us. So the 12th house is a bummer only if, if we're not in a disposition of wishing to lose our attachments. And that's hard to do because you don't want to disturb your life too much with this stuff. That's why it's like baby steps, baby steps, baby steps. Because what we're talking about is working with subtle prana when we're talking about our attachments. We're not, we're not talking this non-human, uh, um, like hyper-idealism type of a thing. You know what I mean by being like perfect and non-attachment? But it's rather, it's a compassionate caring for our own happiness. And very slowly with love, noticing where attachments are because now we are perceiving them as obstructions to real love, real bliss. You see what I mean? So holding it in that space of positivity allows the process to happen in a in a much more enjoyable way because when the when the so everybody has 12th house everybody has all this so no matter what what you're talking astrologically say you don't say you have planets in your 12th house you don't have it doesn't none of that matters again this is really kind of a way of understanding the architecture of our psyches and the architecture of nature herself so the twelfth house is is a liberation house, and therefore, when activity happens in the twelfth house of life, which it always does, at some point every year, the sun goes through your twelfth house. At some point every month, the moon goes through your twelfth house, and so forth and so on. Every 27 and a half or so years, Saturn goes through your 12th house. This is everyone, regardless of your natal chart. This, this is just the basic physics of life. So this is a, these, are, these are domains of life loss. It's a domain of our life. What yoga does is gives you a, con, a wisdom context so that we can understand that domain of our life in a positive way. And so if I'm interested in sustaining real happiness, I'm all about the 12th house. But I want it to happen at a, at a moderate pace, please. <laughs> I'm not in a rush, because to be in a rush is very, it makes things very hard. It's enough to deal with the karmas one at a time, you know. <laughs> That's why sometimes, you know, people shy away from yoga practice because you can feel right in there it's going to open you up and you're going you're gonna to experience some of your attachments. And from a distance, when we're feeling resistance to that process, from a distance, that feels like the opposite of getting more love. It feels like, you're, it feels like love is being taken away from you. But when you get inside of it, you experience it's quite the opposite. It's a love affair. That's the only reason we want to get rid of our attachments because it's a love affair. Why else would we be willing to go through pain but to get to love? And to embrace that process is a person of growth. That's a beautiful quality. But it need not be uptight and rigid because this thing's already too tough. So relax into it and enjoy and takes the edge off, not, taking, not being too much of a critic of ourselves. You'll be a critic of yourself, some of us more than others. It just depends. We all have different tendencies. Some people have overly positive minds, and it keeps them in a, a delusion that way. Some people have overly negative minds, it keeps them in a delusion that way. No matter the case, what we all can do is just notice how our unique mind tends to operate, what our unique emotional patterns are, 
uh, our unique reactivity responses that tend to come up and up uh, and up 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 and again and around and around and around and around and around over and over and over. How do I speak about it like that? Because I'm because of me. And so that's all of us. But to notice it without electricity, without charge, without feeling like there's something wrong with you is much better, in my opinion. Because, because it makes, it makes, you know, it's not so self important. It's, it's making, making sure we keep, endeavor at least to keep a lightness about ourselves. We do our best. And that, but that, I think, a lot of times starts with being compassionate towards ourselves in regards to our own inner critics. And to allow your, so sometimes the inner critic, if you have a strong inner critic, you just need to let it chirp. <laughs> you know what I mean? Give it a little room. Let it chirp. You know? That's what we, sometimes we can do with like our most trusted friends. You know, we can just let our minds chirp. But it's this wisdom to keep it in the most trusted friends. That's a sacred circle. Sometimes it's just between two people. To where you can let your mind flow and you know that's a sacred place, that that's not going to go anywhere else. It's not going to gossip out into any other place. And that's healthy because you just let your mind express itself. And your good friends know it doesn't represent the real you. It just represents the flows of emotion coming through you. And you have love for each other because you're friends. But keep it a sacred circle. Don't gossip shit. That's, a that, that, that's, that's breaking of trust. N not pointing fingers. Speaking to my own mind as well. So this is the type of mindfulness that compassion practice brings into our life. And then when you get the 12th house energy into it, it humbles you. Because loss can happen, and loss is humbling, isn't it? But it'll make you, take you into bliss. The 12th house is like Pisces. It's etheric. It's akashic. It's intuitive. So if you're into intuition, the 12th house is your friend. Wise people don't worry about the 12th house at all. They don't even worry when Jupiter is going into the 12th house because they'll know, let me give money away. It, because now you're in alignment. Let me, the thing I'm attached to, let me actively give it away. I don't need, I don't, I, then I won't, it won't have to hit me like a difficult karma. Because it's, all of this is nature just trying to put us into its supreme rhythm. But our minds and our karmas and all of our emotional patterns and tendencies keep us on our little rhythm. When there's this macro majestic rhythm you can synchronize with, but that's the practice of yoga. But we want to turn it into a bunch of rules and things you must do. Must get up at this time. Must do this thing. Must do this kriya. Must do this thing. <laughs> that works only for a minute <laughs> it can be helpful I guess if it's considered like just starter kit you know because you need some rules because you're, you're running amok alright but once you get the thing harnessed a little bit make your own choices I, that's what I think. Trust your own wisdom. Trust yourself to do what you need to do so you stay connected to your wisdom. Get guidance as needed. Always test the guidance against your own wisdom. I think it's pretty simple. And... But I think it's trust yourself to be intuitive. This is the twelfth house. It is, is, it is idealism, but it's the idealism of a supreme reality. That's why Pisces people can be very idealistic. Pisces is the 
natural 12th house. It's the 12th constellation. And idealism is not a negative quality. Idealism is, can be quite a beautiful quality. When idealism is held as a vision that helps us to live our lives in, in more beautiful ways. But idealism also can be a pain in the ass, and idealism can also, also create a bit of, um, you know, Jupiter can create ego too. So the expansive planets, the sun, these expansive planets can absolutely uh, balloon a humkara, the sense of self. It's, in this case, in a Jupiterian's case, a sense of wisdom. So Jupi Jupiter and Pisces are related. Jupiter rules Pisces. So that's the connection to Jupiter to the 12th house. And Jupiter to Pi is the ruler of Pisces in Vedic astrology. And so, and so if we do have idealism, but then you realize it's, it's hopeless, you know what I mean? What do you do? That's kind of what we were talking about the other day, you know. Which catastrophe do you even choose? And then Eugene gave me a great, a great little bit of wisdom that he gathered somewhere and shared it with me. He said, he said, he uh, gave the analogy of if there, you're coming up on a multi-car accident. It's a very 12th house analogy, a multi-car accident. And there's, you know, suffering everywhere and wreckage everywhere. Which one, you know, out of all the people who are suffering, you have limited energy, which one do you choose? The one that's closest to you. That's a great little analogy for when you're trying to think about what's my dharma? Out of all the accidents around you, which one is closest to you? That could be in your inner world, though, too. You see? Out of all the suffering around, which is the closest? Which one has the most profound effect on you, too? That reminds me of the famous, uh, the famous little tale from India in the a great sage sitting by some water with a student and uh, a scorpion had fallen in the water and the sage picks it up and the scorpion stings him he puts it on the ground puts it on the land the scorpion falls he keeps falling back in the water the sage keeps picking up stings him and the student asks his, he's like guruji why do you you know he keeps stinging you why do you Keep picking up, he said, it's the scorpion, it's the scorpion's dharma is to sting. He said, but, yeah, but why pick it up? He said, it's the human's dharma is to save. Interesting, huh? <laughs> to save life, to lift up life, to be creative, to help others. So... The beauty of, of living like a yogi, and that has, it takes no outer, ch you know, I think it might be important to say, it requires no change of outer appearances. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, you don't need a hat or, or a nice shawl or anything. It's all an inner thing. And and the inner thing is to be able to see the positive and the negative and the negative and the positive and to live through the space between. You're able to dance into the negative and dance into the positive, but you do it because you know that joy and misery are dances within a dream. And we're participating. It's a lucid dream. We're participating in it. We're enjoying it. It's, it's, it's emanation of, of pure in love, intelligence, the whole thing, wisdom. This is the yogi's vision, you see? It's very ideal. It's a vision. But we're not stuck on it as it's, it's an ideal that, is, that we also understand is 
a mirage. Sights and forms are like a town projected by a magician. So this is the twelfth house. It's etheric, it's akashic, it's subtle, it's formless. And it's called the house of loss because when we, it does come time for us to leave our bodies, we will become very akashic. Earth melts into water, water melts into fire. Fire melts into air, and air melts into ether. And that's the five elements. And so as the, as the elements dissipate in our, our organism, our sense of what we are will definitely change. Just like in, a medita in this type of an experience, your subtlety is much greater now than a few days ago, true? And so it changes your perception of you, doesn't it? in a certain basic way, your sense of me. Sense it. So what is it doing? It's called purification, the twelfth house, of ahankara, this part of the psyche that is self-identifying. Is it clear? And this is just a part of our psyche that is self-identifying. It doesn't represent the real us. The real us is... The, is far more boundless in nature. But what that boundlessness is, is what the experience of yoga is about. Little by little, blossoming. Baby steps, baby steps though, because with that blossoming, those attachments will have to fall away. And so we want to pace out our suffering. <laughs> Don't we? So we can enjoy life. But sometimes life doesn't give us the opportunity to pace by saying pace out my suffering that means I'm not in a rush because I know that all along the way of me experiencing the supreme me whatever that is it has a it's there's a, still a whole lot of habits that are going to need to fall away inner habits ways of thinking ways of emoting and this type of stuff so this is a process and why rush it? Just don't let it stagnate. You see? So, and then it's, that's, that's another example of finding the space between. You're not stopping, you're not stop, you're not going super fast, you're flowing. Flow with it. Trust life. That's the basic message of the 12th house. Because when you don't flow with it, nature responds. Nature shows us that we're not flowing with it, but we may not interpret it that way because we're just experiencing a sickness or we're just experiencing an emotional uh, you know, difficulty or something like this. But when, when the vision of, that we hold, the ideal vision that we hold of, our, of reality is that everything is, is actually, that the Guru is everything and everywhere. that the guru is not a person at all. It's the living wisdom of life. And so the twelfth house shows us how to see that everywhere. So, when we're practicing yoga, the twelfth house is ideal. <laughs> when you're doing your accounting, not as much. <laughs> that type of thing. You know what I mean? Do so you see how context is everything? It's not about the content. It's always about the context. Context always is supreme to content. Yeah. Hey, thanks for watching on YouTube. Best easy way to stay in touch with us. Hit the subscribe button here. You'll see our videos when they come up. If you enjoyed this one, hit the like button. It'll help more people see it, help the channel grow. I appreciate you watching.